Welcome to the Social Housing Podcast from Voicecape, the only podcast dedicated to helping social landlords build sustainable tenancies. During this series of podcasts, we'll be speaking to leaders from the social housing sector and beyond, hopefully challenging the status quo a little bit, and also stimulating discussion around how technology can be better utilised to help build sustainable tenancies. I'm your host, John Doyle, the Chief Exec and Founder of Voicegate. On today's Social Housing Podcast, I would like to consider the question of whether registered social landlords are part of the solution to the housing crisis, or if in fact they're part of the problem. To consider that conundrum, I am joined by Gary Oakley, who is currently Executive Director of Growth at Platform Housing. He has a wealth of experience from the social housing sector and also with private builders, Barrett Homes and David Wilson Homes. Welcome to the Social Housing Podcast. Welcome, Garant. To kick off the conversation, I'd like to ask you your opinion on who you think is best situated and best suited to help solve the housing crisis. Well, I've been saying for quite, quite a few years now that um, housing associations are uniquely positioned to really uh, adapt and identify what, what causes the housing crisis. It's not a single factor. There's a lot of things involved with that. And therefore, they are obviously the in the prime position to look at solutions to that. And I think the other point I'd like to raise is that we work very closely with Homes England. We're very much embedded with the local regions that we work within. Uh, and obviously, housing associations at a, at a national level are lobbying continuously for changes in the way that we actually can provide more homes. And of course, housing associations are in a very financially capable position to manage that build program and create thousands of new homes a year. Okay. I remember when we were talking earlier that one of the key challenges, it seemed to me, is the, um, the question of land acquisition. Because I suppose there's more to building a house than just building a house. I wonder if you could just sort of speak to us on that and, and what the challenges are, particularly faced by social landlords. Yeah, we, we all know that the housing market at the moment is in a very, very... Um, turbulent period there's an incredible kind of price rises across different regions and that obviously is reflected in what is you know the, the raw material of buying land getting out there in the land market and it's an incredibly competitive world to, to operate in you know buying the right land in the right locations is absolutely critical but we're competing against you know big volume house builders regional housing developers and to some extent other HAs obviously uh, we're, we're in competition with each other which makes it all the more challenging and and obviously one of the other challenges, of course, to get the right residual land values, we, we are building affordable homes, we're building um, less dense neighbourhoods, we are looking at building really great public spaces, uh, a, a, a sense of community. So, you know, we, we have that less dense um, housing offer, and therefore we don't get the same residual land values as you would do if you were building high density volume house building. And, and that is a challenge. But, you know, obviously, I think some of the solutions to that have to be looking at how we can partner with local authorities going forward. Am, am I right in thinking that some of the local authorities themselves are competing with social landlords for land acquisition as well? Are they part of the mix? Absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> local authorities are under a huge amount of pressure at the moment, as we all know, with funding and cuts. And, and they've got to look at the way in which they can operate effectively and use their assets. And some of their assets are obviously land. And, and they are looking at how they can move into the, the, that environment. And there are many local authorities that have property divisions now. And of course, with that, comes its own challenges. One, <clears throat> buying land, making that work, having the right skill sets to build once you've got that land under your control. Uh, the planning process is difficult. And of course, they're, <laughs> they're inherently building in their local authority. So it is quite a challenge for them. And it's politically quite sensitive too. So just so I'm clear, there are local authorities who are building housing for sale. This isn't, they're not building like we would have thought of old council houses or social houses. The building houses for profit to use the funds to do other things. Is, is that right? Am I getting that right? Local authorities, yeah, well, they are looking at how they can do that, how they can, they can cross-subsidize other things they do. So some local authorities are looking at that. Some local authorities are building council houses, uh, and, and, you know, and all credit to them. 
but as I said, it's a very, very competitive market to be in. It's you have to know what you're doing, you know, from the, from the outset, what land you're buying, what land you're using under your your, your existing asset base, um, and and selling houses on the open market is a challenge in itself. And again, I come back to that point that there's only so many skilled people out there that know how to do that very effectively, and that is going to be a challenge for anybody starting out in that field. And SMEs feel it as well. We've lost a lot of SMEs during the, the last 15 years, since the 2007, 2008. Uh, and, and that is a very difficult market to get back into because your return on capital is challenged because once you buy that plot of land, it takes a long time to get planning consent on it and, and to see that money coming back in from your sales. Okay, that that's leads quite nicely into what I was going to ask you anyway, Garain, about planning. Now, we're constantly hearing about planning reform. I don't think a lot of people know what it is, but I was just wondering... Have the more recent reforms, if there've been any, to plan in, are they helping or hindering the situation, in your opinion? Oh, <clears throat> I think that every planning reform that I've seen that was intended to speed up the process and simplify it has done the exact opposite. I think it's a challenge. It's not, and again, it's not the single fail, failure point, but planning is an issue. It takes a long time to get consented schemes to ground. It can take two to three years. And if you think you're buying land for millions of pounds, <clears throat> And you're going to wait two or three years down the line before you get your first sales receipts in. That is quite a challenge for SMEs and startups and the local authorities and HAs as well. So, yeah, I think it's a number of things that are in, implicating that. It's, you know, you've got the challenge of nimbyism, which, which affects us all, all the time. Um, and that's not going away. You've got quite um, a complicated system that, you know, if you're new entrance to the market, it's quite a, a difficult thing to get your head around. Local authorities, as I said, they are stretched. Their resources are thin. Uh, planning teams are thin on the ground. And to get planning sorted out, you need highly skilled planners in local authorities and, and officers in highways uh, that can sign off your section agreements and so on. So it's, yeah, it's, it's very much um, a critical part of the process. Okay, and something else that I just wanted to challenge while we were on, because I, I've spoken to you previously and it, and it amazed me, uh, some of the information that you gave me. But it's this idea of, the misconception that the place is getting crowded. You know, this idea of, oh, you know, that, that's part of the nimbyism, isn't it? We don't want any more houses, we're too busy, roads, schools, etc. But when it comes down to the actual facts of the matter, I thought maybe you could talk about that illusion of Greenbelt and what that's doing, and just how crowded is the United Kingdom? Yeah, well, it, this is quite a startling fact, and, and I checked it up after I spoke to you, John, just to make sure I was right. <laughs> so we've all got this perception that we've, we've over developed across the whole of the UK and that um, there's a massive density of urban development everywhere. That's not the case. Only 2% of the land in England is built on and only 0.1% is continuous urban ribbon. So that, that is quite a misconception. Uh, and I do know there are incredibly dense estates in city centres and so on. But if you look at it as a whole, and we have to look at it as a whole, because the housing crisis isn't about one area, it's about rural areas, it's about urban, suburban city centres, it's how we unlock all that potential. And another thing, of course, is that a lot of people's misconception of the green belt is that it, it, it is fit for purpose, that it's been looked at, it's been redesigned, it hasn't been, it's been in place for a, quite a long time. Uh, and as a result, I don't think it's fit for purpose now, I think we need to review the green belt situation, I think we need to look at our cities and urban areas and see how we can best utilize the land around the towns and cities to provide more homes. Because what you tend to get, you get a donut effect. You've got the green belt around the city or and, and then people move out to the uh, surrounding villages and towns and it's, it's like daisy chain. You're basically putting a lot of stress on that infrastructure, the transport infrastructure, you're building in towns that don't necessarily have the right schools in the right places, access to um, hospitals, doctors, and all that goes with it. And on top of that, you have commuter poverty. So people get in and out of the urban areas where they work. So I think there needs to be a much more holistic view on how we can solve that. And that comes back really to planning again, doesn't it, as you say? It comes back to planning and politics without a shadow of a doubt. I think it's such a sensitive area. If you look at a recent by-election result where it was blamed on announcements from government saying that they want to free up the building process for new homes and fast track housing to urgently needed areas, and I don't see a problem with that zone of solution, but it is highly politicised. You know, you've got people making decisions on planning applications that have probably got their eye on the next, next election rather than what the numbers are. <laughs> well, we won't get too political at this stage, Garain, because everything <laughs> seems to come back to politics, doesn't it, at the end of the day? Yeah. Just on returning to um, 
social la social landlords. Obviously, you've worked for a live social landlord, and I'm just curious again what you think about this idea of of surpluses, profit surpluses, call it what you will. But there is a perception that there are a lot of large landlords sat on a whole pile of money, belly aching about the housing situation, and not necessarily mobilising those surpluses to do anything about it. I just wonder what your thoughts were on that. Yeah, I think, well, surplus, profit, you know, you've got to make a profit to gain that surplus and you've got to be active. And the way we get our funds, you know, is through grants, through raising capital ourselves, from borrowing, uh, from rent, obviously. Um, but if we, I think we've got an obligation to build more homes. It's the raison d'etre of, of housing associations to provide homes and provide services to support our customers. And that's absolutely the key. And I think that, can, that comes with a lot of responsibility. We, you know, some of the HAs in England, particularly, are, are huge organisations with with massive turnovers. Uh, and I know a lot of them are always looking at how they can increase their development uh, profile. But you know, there there are a lot of challenges out there, and I think that um, the risk management element of it is, uh, you know, the risk adversity side of it has to be looked at. What is realistic risk for a developing HA? And if they've got the right skill sets, the right checks and balances and financial measures and governance in place, which we are regulated on, then surely we should be looking at how we can maximise the surplus that are sat there to build more homes. And, and don't forget, you know, the housing stock is ageing. Uh, you know, we've got hugely aged estates that are challenged that we need to look at. How do we regenerate them? And that comes at a cost. So we've got to really look again at the whole development profile and what we can do to unlock those opportunities. Okay, uh, you've spoken at different points about the skill sets required to do this. Um, obviously, skills that are short in local authorities and potentially in housing associations as well. I'm just wondering, will that inevitably lead to more consolidation? Do you see more consolidation coming down the line amongst housing providers? Because, you know, those skill sets are short. You have to you have to get them into somewhere. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts on that might be. Yeah, I think we've got to be re realistic and pragmatic about scale. What, what is the right scale and how big should you be? But I do think there's there's always a challenge for smaller housing associations that have, as I said, age in stock. Um, it's, it's more costly and, and um, inefficient, and they have to look at the ways they can they can improve that. And obviously, if you're a developing HA, you're growing your stock size, you can charge against your properties, you can generate funds, you can do more. And I think that, you know, realistically, as you say, that, you know, there are a finite number of highly skilled people out there. And, and it's a small sector. It feels massive sometimes. It feels incredibly huge. But in reality, it's a relatively small sector. And I think, you know, as I mentioned, we're going through a change uh, and we, the way we, we, we build has got to be looked at and, and move to MMC, um, advanced methods of, methods of construction. You know, what skill sets do we need to do that? What sort of future apprenticeships? And on top of that, you know, where, where are we going to get the sales teams? Where are we going to get the construction management teams from? Because I know that, you know, it's a, it's a tough market out there to, to get the right people in. We're competing against volume house builders, regional house builders, uh, SMEs. So you, you we're all after the same sort of quality of people to come and work with us. And councils now, as you said, they, you know, they're looking at how they can operate their own property companies. And, you know, that, that's, that's a challenge for everybody. And, and we've got to realistically think about, is there opportunities for dev codes that operate across HAs? And, and can they, if they do merge, what are the benefits for the customer? Because that's got to be, you know, it's got to be about what's right for the customer. But how can we maximise our capability to build more homes and provide those services? Okay. So can I just ask you a question then about platform? Because I know you and I have talked about what really are great potential career opportunities within the social housing sector, simply because there's a lot of demand placed on the sector. And what, what differences and what changes are you seeing going on at platform that, that sort of speak to that? Yeah, I, I, I think I mentioned it to you before. When I left... Um, the commercial house building sector my colleague said you're going to be bored in housing and i'll tell you I'm, i've been perplexed baffled and confused but i've never ever been bored it's an incredibly exciting environment to work in the range of things that has do from you know getting youngsters off the streets teaching them life skills getting them into a secure home helping vulnerable people into a home protecting families looking after the elderly providing care services step down services getting people into education and employment and there's a wealth of experience out there to learn from as well. And I, 
I think if you if you took people and said, look, this is a housing so this is a complex housing association. They manage fifty six thousand homes all over the UK, um, varying types of home, high rise, you know, rural homes. You've got lawyers involved, planners, construction teams, maintenance teams. You know, you've got landscape teams. There's, there's such a wealth of experience to be learned in a housing association. I think, you know, any graduates are out there or somebody coming out of school looking for apprenticeships, definitely a housing association gives you that variety. And, and you go home at the end of the week knowing you've contributed something positive, which is even better. Fantastic. Well, what I'd like to do is just wrap up on a final question for you, Gary. It's not a really fair question, but it's a it's my magic wand question. Basically, if there was if you had a magic wand and there was one fundamental change you could make to make your life easier and the lives of other guys like you in the sector trying to do a similar type of job, what would you what would you do? I would make the housing minister role in government far more senior and stop changing them every eight to ten months. It, it, it's a clear and obvious solution. If we want consistency, we want to embed positive change and long-term strategies to overcome the housing crisis. It needs to be a senior cabinet position and it needs to stay in post for longer than eight months. I think that almost comes back to the point you made earlier about skill sets. <laughs> Absolutely. And, yeah, you know, and shortage of them in the right place. The right people doing the right thing in the right place. That's what you need. And, and that's across the board. And it, it, it um, rotating housing ministers. And it's not any particular party. It, it's been a consistent methodology of, of swapping them and moving them on quite quickly. And I don't get that allowed, doesn't allow the sector to really embed, influence, lobby, and be thought provoking um, partners in, in, the, in the crisis. Okay, well, on that note, Gary, I'd really like to thank you for your time and your insights. It's a part of social housing that I've never truly understood, but I, I'm beginning to get a much better understanding from all the challenges you've high highlighted. So thanks for being a guest on the Social Housing Podcast. Thank you, John. It's been a pleasure. You're welcome.